My name is Adam Rossi with Adam Solar Resources. So I'm Evan Endress. I'm a project coordinator with uh, Citizens for Pennsylvania's Future. We're, we're Penn Future here in Pittsburgh. Basically here at Adam Solar Resources, we uh, sell and design and install uh, solar systems, both photovoltaic and solar thermal. Um, and we're just starting to branch into electric vehicle charge stations um, and electric vehicles as well. Penn Future is a statewide public interest organization with uh, offices in Philadelphia, Harrisburg and Pittsburgh and also Wilkes-Barre. And we were formed about 12 years ago um, as, a, as a group that does clean energy and environmental work. So solar energy um, is basically harvesting the sun's energy. Uh, with thermal, it's making hot water for us. So similar to just a garden hose and a driveway is you know, the best analogy I could give for how solar thermal works. Uh, photovoltaics um, is actually a, a process that was discovered, I think, in the 40s, maybe. Um, and it converts um, the rays of sunshine into electricity. Um, I would say the internet is probably the best to see a demo, but from what I understand, you know, it knocks the electrons off of the, the coated cells and then produces a current. Um, it, it's basically magic, but it works. <laughs> so we have uh, six packs of 30 evacuated tube collectors here. We use it to uh, heat hot water, solar thermal. Um, and with that hot water, we heat our building. We have radiant floors. So behind me, all of the uh, tops of those manifolds, there's water getting pumped through. Uh, inside of each of those tubes, I'll be able to show you guys later, there's a heat pipe um, and it's in a a vacuum so when the sun hits it, it heats up that heat pipe, the water comes up and boils um, and then we pass our cold water by it to heat it and then it um, gets transferred in a storage tank down below to go into our floor to heat the building. Um, you can see these are tilted up compared to some of the other solar on our roof. Um, we want to catch as much as the winter sun as possible so for our latitude we have these tipped up at 55 degrees. Here's a close up on the evacuated tube I was discussing on the roof with the uh, heat pipe inside of it. So there's a little bit of antifreeze in there that boils. Uh, this is also in a vacuum and then makes this heat pipe extremely hot. Um, and then you can see just this is how it fit inside there up on the roof. All this hot water that we're making for people that aren't aware of what it is, uh, radiant floor. So here's our manifold. All these tubes are going through the six inch slab of concrete, um, which then heats the building. So here's the solar control room for the six evacuated tube collectors we saw up on the roof. Here's our drain back tank. You step in here, I'll show you inside. It's actually running right now. If you look inside there, there's a copper coil heat exchanger down inside. I don't know if you can see that. So, basically what's happening, uh, this differential controller is looking at the temperature up on the uh, collectors versus the uh, temperature that's in the tank. Whenever there's a difference of more than 15 degrees or so, it gives power to this pump and it sucks the water out from the tank, goes up, goes up to the roof, goes through all six of those collectors, maybe gains 5, 10, 15 degrees, and then comes back into this tank. And that just cycle keeps going on. So basically, even though this is our drain back, or drain back storage tank, we think of it as just a giant heat exchanger because what we want to do with all this hot water as soon as we get it is put it on our floor because the concrete of 6,000 square feet is what's really retaining all of our heat. That's more like a 12,000 gallon storage tank if you want to consider it that way. Out in Europe and uh, China, you can see on many of the roofs there, everyone uses this technology to heat their water. Uh, it's very efficient and with the evacuated tube, you can reach a little bit higher temperature than a traditional flat plate which we'll show you in a moment. So here we have uh, 13 Solar World monocrystalline panels. Um, it's a USA made panel, um, 60 cell monocrystalline means it's a little bit more efficient. Um, we coupled this system with microinverters made by Enphase, a great company. Um, that way each one of these sort of acts as its own individual solar system. Um, even though this light is pretty similar all the way throughout, each module might be actually making a little bit more than the next uh, module to it. Um, you know, these will peak out around 220, 225 watts with the 240 watt module. Um, and this 13 panel array right now does about 20 to 30 percent of the building's um, power needs. Um, but eventually we'll continue all the way across with about an 11 or 12K system. This right here is a 3.12 kW. Since that system's been commissioned, looks like we're about just to turn 409 kilowatt hours. The whole reason we got into this business is because we just see things are not going quite the right way. You know, I, I just heard the other day we're, we're spending almost a million dollars per minute on foreign oil um, and we have to get our energy sources another way. And using the sun, which is there pretty much every day for us to harvest, we have the technology to convert it. We can continue to burn coal 
and uh, and uranium to to uh, to generate our electricity. But those are finite resources, and they're going to run out. So, wanting to have a sustainable future, I think, is uh, solar panel and wind energy needs to be a part of our energy sources going going forward. There there is less environmental impact uh, from a kilowatt. Of, of energy produced by solar panels. And that's very important. So that helps clean our air, helps clean our water, diversify our grid. It creates a, 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 the ability for business owners to um, you know, create new business models and, and uh, you know, employ people. So there's a, a whole list of, of economic benefits. Um, I just don't see any reason why we're not doing it other than uh, I don't know the reason. It should be done. I just I think it's great for America. But it also means that America is continuing to innovate and going beyond what we've we've primarily relied on in the past and saying we're gonna we're going to use technology and innovation and constantly find for better and, and the best way to produce energy. Um, and, and the feeling that I see or that I get personally and that I see in my customers once they do go solar, it changes them. It's not just another investment. Um, it's something that actually deep down clicks with them and makes sense and they change their lifestyle based on realizing to live more in tune with um, what they can produce for themselves. The, the biggest challenge is, is money. Okay, Solar energy, um, although it's getting more cost competitive over time, is still more expensive than uh, the, the fossil fuel um, uh, sources that we've relied on. Coal companies, the gas companies, the oil companies, they're the ones with the money and money controls things. So until solar gets to that grid parity tipping point, um, it's hard to break through. When you're comparing what it, what it costs to produce a kilowatt of, of solar, and you're comparing that to what it, it, uh, what's produced, uh, uh, what it costs to produce a kilowatt of coal, that coal is not taking into consideration all the externalized costs. So that's the impact on people's health. That's uh, the impact on the, the source of extraction. That's, um, you know, that's the additional cost of, of upgrading uh, old coal plants. We're almost there uh, in some regions of the country where solar is just as inexpensive as it is to build a new power plant. And once that sort of starts get rolling, um, and, and, you know, and people like yourself who make this documentary and are getting out there and pushing it, it, it you have to put it in the people's hands and, and just and push the message that it's real, it works. We've gotten the, the, the solar on the grid that we've gotten because the government has realized the, the value of having clean energy and realized the economic value. And they've, they've provided programs that make it easier um, for these, these installations to be financed. You start getting into you know, the price for oil when you include what the military has spent on you know, oil related wars. And then you start, you know, uh, on the oil side, this number start accelerating beyond anything. So when you consider the overall economic picture, you know, the cost of an electric car compared to the cost of, of a gallon of gas when you include health benefits, a, a couple wars, you know, <laughs> you know, maybe some other externalized costs that we're not considering, you're in, you're in, you're in a completely different realm. You know, change is hard for people to accept, but once they, you know, you, you can make a clear decision based on here's, you know, clean emission free energy versus here's living next to a coal fired power plant. It, you know, I think the transition will occur. It's just you know, kicking and screaming for some, but it, it's coming. When talking about misconceptions, the biggest one, and I fought for many years and still do with some people, is that it just doesn't work in Pittsburgh because we only have, you know, X number of sunny days and it's normally cloudy. Uh, you know, what they don't realize is there's plenty of solar energy hitting us here in, in Pittsburgh. You know, there's uh, the, the number one country in solar energy is Germany. They have so much solar capacity installed and they get less sunshine than we do here in Pittsburgh. Go on our website and look at our live monitoring software in a rainstorm and you'll see some of the bigger arrays putting out enough energy to run a small house. The solar energy um, that is hitting Pittsburgh is said to be about you know, 80% of what's hitting South Florida when you count in weather and, ge and the geographical location. So it's actually more solar energy here than people think. We took uh, you know, this solar panel here out to uh, a Steelers game uh, once and, and uh, you know, just showed people how the system works and it was, uh, it was in January and it was cold and it was cloudy and this, this, this thing was, was churning out kilowatt hours like, like, you know, like it was supposed to be. Uh, but we had a lot of people that would come up to it and they'd put their hand next to it, thinking it was going to give off heat. Um, so, you know, these things don't give off heat. So it can work. It's just, you know, there are optimum and ideal conditions. And if you can make enough energy, 
Um, on the sunny days, that's all that really counts. Uh, for a homeowner, um, you know, a lot of the people that come to us are looking for the financial side of it. They need to see the numbers work, which they do. There are a couple benefits. One, of course, you're saving energy um, by producing energy. So you're, uh, you're, you're decreasing the amount of, of energy that you have to buy from the electric company. I, I like to say, if you're going to be buying electricity for the rest of your life, which most people plan to use electricity, you know, why not just pay up front you know, a 10-year check to get electricity for the next 30 or 40 years. Lock in that rate. If you know you're gonna be staying somewhere, um, or even the next person that buys your home knows that they're gonna be using the electricity, why not just invest up front? There is a, uh, there's a, a value added to their property. So just like you install a new kitchen or a new bathroom, there is a, there's a certain uh, increase in your property value that, that, that you have to consider there. And who knows what the markets will do. I'm under the impression that energy prices are going to continue to escalate and rise, so your panels are only going to become more valuable over time. Um, and then the final thing is, is that, you know, even though most solar panels in our region won't work unless they're grid tied, unless they have a battery backup system, there's a lot of people that, that do it because they want to um, contribute to America's energy independence. They see the international uh, you know issues that we've we've dealt with over the last 10 years and they say I have the power to make an investment on my own property an investment that benefits me and I have the power to do something about this and help contribute to a real solution after I purchased the car back in February I started to think about um, what I was using to actually fuel the vehicle. The one thing too that I have a big passion for is what I call PV plus EV photovoltaics plus electric vehicles um, like I said, I have a lot of concerns with the amount of money we're paying for foreign oil every minute uh, in our country. And one of the things that I think can alleviate that is if we use electric vehicles. And then the immediate response is, well, those just come from, you know, polluting coal plants or something like that. But you can say, no, you can use solar energy to charge your vehicle. It's great that I've switched from using Middle Eastern oil to fuel my transportation and now I've, I'm using American energy and that was one of the great things that, that I really wanted with the car. I'm not starting to think, well, you know, maybe I could use cranberry energy. When you combine uh, a solar system with an electric car, really what you're doing is, is not only um, replacing your gasoline with electricity, but you're replacing your gasoline with a renewable source of electricity. So, so what you're doing at, at, at the end of the day is really filling your gas tank with, with sunlight. The Tesla's out is one of the fastest cars I've ever been in personally. Uh, the Volt is out there, the Nissan Leaf, Honda, Kia, Hyundai, they're all releasing electric vehicles in the next few years. I've made my house energy efficient, then I've installed solar panels. Now I'm going to change the way I, I drive around and buy an electric car and then plug that into all the changes that I've made in my, in my, my little homestead here, my, my uh, household. Um, you know, you really, you really start to see how, how these layered uh, uh, technologies can impact uh, the environment and your bottom line. I know that the, the sort of the fuel that I'm driving with my car is no longer coming from a, maybe a source that I can't control, but it's a source that I can. And to be able to, uh, to drive on sunshine is actually pretty exciting uh, when I go to and from work or running errands every day. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just sort of marvelous how the technology has come together to be able to do such a thing. Um, you know, I, I do it here, riding back and forth to work on an electric bike, uh, just because I haven't made enough to afford a Volt or a Tesla for myself yet, but those days will come. Um, I'm actually working on converting a, an old Honda CRX to be 100% electric by doing a swap. I think that's going to be part of our future too, is being able to do conversions to take, uh, you know, vehicles that are totally capable just out, out of their, uh, their gas engine life is over and you put an electric motor and keep on motoring. Um, behind me here are, what are considered electric bicycles. Um, you know, it's hard for me to get into the electric car business right off the bat. This is a little cheaper way to get started to have my own EV. Um, each one of these is about $1,000 retail. Um, it has functional pedals on it, so you can actually pedal it or you can use the electric motor on it. There are 500 watt hub motors. Uh, these bikes will get about 20-25 miles range on a single charge and that only costs about 3 or 4 cents. So commuting can be very cheap. Um, people in other countries use these everywhere. We still have problems with legislation in Pennsylvania. I'm pushing as hard as I can to make sure that they acknowledge these as electric bicycles that were protected under federal law, but uh, still some hoops to, to conquer there. 
All you do, pull the throttle and away it goes. So uh, this is an older Honda CRX that I purchased. It was one of my favorite cars I always wanted when I was in high school as a kid and never got. And found one that was uh, in really good condition from down south. So uh, picked it up, pulled out the engine that was blown, and the plan is to convert it to be 100% electric. We're going to either get a DC or AC motor in there. Um, still debating on what kind of batteries to get, whether we're going to have the money to buy lithium ion batteries or just stick with the traditional uh, lead acid batteries like most people think of when they think of a car battery. Um, the conversion cost, which a lot of people ask, is probably between six and ten thousand dollars depending on what components we select. Uh, the car should be able to go about 50 or 60 miles on a charge um, and ideally every time I charge it hopefully it'll be from the sun. I've sort of mentioned um, you know what what it takes you know what it takes to get us to this point of, of um, you know uh, um, a, a grid that contains more renewable energy and and wh what I said was it takes people that recognize a, a good investment when they see it it takes people that are willing to get on the ground and advocate and, and really be a, a warrior for renewable energy for whatever their reason is and and there are people in in the community of Pittsburgh that do this and and they embrace it wholeheartedly they share their story time and time again they 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 take the time to learn about uh, the all the little details and 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 then they ask how they can plug in you know and that's that's what Penn Future does we provide opportunities uh, where people can plug in and, and and learn and then help others to learn even if it's an elected official um, so you know we, we find these worry you know these sort of these advocates out there in, in Western Pennsylvania in people like George Tatullos who who you know has not only embraced solar energy but also embraced a, a, a next level in in uh, alternative transportation. Um, one of our favorite installs was for George Tatullos. He actually was the first Chevy Volt owner in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, and we were fortunate enough to get to give him a solar install. And that was our first exposure ourselves too to the PV plus EV, where we're actually charging a vehicle from the sun. And it's just, you know, it's really neat to say, okay, you know, today's commute was brought to you by free energy from the sun that we helped install. There is one car that, uh, that I would love to, to get my eyes on, which is a Tesla Roadster. It was actually the first electric vehicle, um, the first modern electric vehicle that was done by a Silicon Valley startup uh, now, and they, they kind of, I think, inspired this new wave of electric vehicles, including the Volt and the Nissan Leaf. Uh, but this car is a, it's designed by the team that designed the Lotus. It is a, uh, it is a fast car um, with uh, no performance compromises. Uh, that, that is a true, uh, a true testament to what can be done with electric vehicles. This is my Tesla. Back in February, I purchased a Chevy Volt. I was uh, one of the first in Western Pennsylvania to have one. I flew all the way to New York and drove it back. Uh, I was so enthusiastic about the technology. I bought it uh, from the dealership in Washington, D.C., but I first drove the Tesla in uh, New York City at uh, about three years ago and it uh, got me interested in getting one. When they opened the dealership in Washington, D.C., I was there for uh, a meeting, talked to the guy and uh, ordered it and uh, had it delivered here by van in Pittsburgh. It's a great little car. It's fun to drive. has great acceleration and handling. The performance, first of all, is fantastic. Supposedly goes 125 miles an hour. I've not had it up that high. It goes about 40 miles on a charge and uh, a charge only costs a dollar and a quarter to, um, to fully charge the car. And, and the range issues, people worry about range anxiety. I have petroleum anxiety. I'm more, you know, think it's gonna be easier to find an outlet somewhere than it is gonna be find a gas station. It, uh, the range uh, label is about 225, but that's if you're using the sort of economy mode. Uh, realistically, it's probably about 190. 
Um, and after the charge runs out, it actually has a built-in generator that will uh, run on gasoline just like uh, any other car, but at that point it's creating electricity to continue the car for another 300 miles and then you can fill up and keep going. I find I can drive around town all day and then recharge it on 120 volt uh, circuit and be able to drive it the next morning. So it's an electric vehicle with the benefit of when, uh, when the battery runs out, you have a generator to take you anywhere that you want to go. Charging up the Volt is actually pretty easy. Um, there is a button on the remote that'll open up the charger plate, which is over here. And then all I have to do is take this standardized charger, which works with all electric vehicles today, and plug it in. And then uh, it'll, it'll start charging. It takes, about, um, it takes about 10 hours to fully charge the car if you're going from a straight 110 volt uh, uh, standard power outlet in your garage. Uh, but I do have a fast charger installed which will, um, which will fully charge the car in about four hours. So I have two separate arrays on my, on my house. Over the garage there are 10 solar panels and over the main house there's 15 solar panels. So over here on the right hand side we have the two conduits which are bringing the, uh, the energy from the solar panel, one from the house, one from the garage, comes down here and merges together and then comes into this panel which was made just for the garage here and then this panel just ties uh, right into the main panel of the house. Now to monitor all 25 panels the company provides this little box here just showing me at the moment it's producing 4,500 watts of energy right there on my roof with those 25 panels. So it's actually a pretty good production day because of all the sun that we have even though it's uh, here the middle of December. Right here is, the, uh, is my solar production meter. So it's a meter that's continuously running and it's showing how much energy that's being created by the solar panels. It's uh, something that has nothing to do with what I'm using but is only what I've produced. It shows that I've produced uh, uh, 2. 8 megawatt hours so far since I've had the system in July. Penn Power actually came out and put this meter in. It's called a net meter because it has to have the ability to run forwards and backwards depending on how uh, on how much energy that I'm producing and how much energy that I'm using. When people combine solar energy with uh, an electric vehicle you see a multiplier effect in the investments that they've already made. Um, so not only have you created a really fantastic advocate, become a very fantastic advocate, but you've also seen sort of a, a different turn on the investment that you've made. Um, so it's really important to, to understand, you know, uh, how people multiply, um, you know, by, by embracing this sort of, these, these, these new technologies. So the, the solar panels, um, we put them in in July. Um, it's, they're 5.5 kilowatts and they will uh, produce 6.7 megawatt hours in a year. So figure about 7 megawatt hours in a year. Now to figure out how economical that that is, you can think about it in a couple different ways. If you just look at the electricity and the solar credits alone, they should pay back themselves in about 10 years. So the solar panel installation after, uh, after all tax credits was about $20,000 today. Uh, it's dropping every year, but they'll save enough electricity and solar credits to make about $2,000 a year. So that's how you get a 10 year payback. Now the other side, the, the other way to look at the solar panels is that it creates enough energy to drive, uh, to drive this car 20,000 miles a year. So if you just thought about it, well, how much oil am I replacing? You know, if you have a car that got, uh, you know, 20 miles per gallon, that's a thousand gallons of fuel or about $4,000 a year that I'm saving if you sort of look at it from an oil perspective. When, when you start thinking about where we're going to go as a nation, okay, and you start thinking about how innovation connects with, with and intersects with people's everyday lives, um, you know, you see a future where where uh, people have solar panels on their roof, or they're tied into some sort of solar installation, but it goes beyond that. There, you know, it's a it's a change in, in the way we we um, you know it's a change in the way we get around too. So you know, when you connect a um, a, a solar installation to a, an electric vehicle, what you're doing is really sort of embracing uh, you know a future that you know is 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 on its way. Um, you know, we call these folks early adopters out there, uh, and they really are, are on the vanguard of, of sort of a, uh, what we see as, as a new wave, uh, you know, a, a better way to do things, a better way to spend your money. So yeah, bottom line, solar panels are awesome. 
buy them, put them on your roof, power your house, teach your kids, live within your means. You know, don't, don't worry about investing in the stock market and gold. Invest in energy for yourself and for your family for the next 30 or 40 years. That's what's going to matter.